The Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden Agnes speaks, Daughter, stand firm and do not relapse, for a serpent lies at your heels ready to bite. Yet do not rush unduly ahead either, for the tip of a sharp lance is in front of you, and if you advance at the wrong speed, you will be wounded. What does a relapse mean if not letting trials lead to regrets about having taken on a more austere and wholesome way of life and to a desire of returning to old habits and delighting the mind with dirty thoughts? Such thoughts, even if they give some pleasure to the mind, only obscure every good thing and by degrees lead away from all goodness. Nor should you rush unduly ahead, that is, punish yourself beyond your strength or imitate the good works of others beyond your capacity. God has ordained from eternity that heaven should be open to sinners through works of love and humility, yet by preserving moderation and discretion in every way. Now then, the envious devil persuades the imperfect man to fast beyond his strength, to promise to do unaccustomed things that he cannot manage, to desire to imitate more perfect models without considering his own strengths and weaknesses. The devil does this either in order that, when the man's strength fails him, he should continue with his badly begun vows out of human embarrassment rather than for the sake of God, or in order that he should quickly give up the struggle because of his indiscretion and weakness. For this reason, use as your measure your own self, that is, your strengths and weaknesses, since some people are stronger by nature, others weaker, some more fervent by the grace of God, others keener due to good habits. Hence, regulate your life in agreement with the advice of God-fearing men, so that the serpent does not sting you due to your thoughtlessness, and so that the poisonous tip of the sword, that is, the poisonous suggestion of the devil, does not delude your mind so as to make you want to seem more than you are or long to become something beyond your strength and powers. There are, indeed, some people who believe they can reach heaven by their own merits, and God spares them from the devil's temptations due to his hidden plan. There are others who think they can make reparation to God for their transgressions with their own works. The error of all of these is altogether damning, for even if a person were to kill his body a hundred times over, he could not make up a thousandth of the account he owes to God, because it is God who gives us the ability and the will, seasons and health, who fills us with the desire for the good, who gives us riches and honor, who kills and gives life, raises up and lays low. All things are in his hand. Hence to him alone should all honor be given, and no one deserves to be counted for anything before God. Since you are wondering about the lady who came for indulgences but was corrupted, I answer you, there are some women who have the virtue of continence but do not love it. They experience neither a great longing for pleasure, nor violent temptation. If honorable proposals of marriage were made to them, they would accept. However, since no great offers are made to them, they look down on lesser offers. In this way, continence sometimes gives rise to pride and presumption, which, by divine permission, leads to a fall, such as you have now heard. If a woman were so minded as not to want to be stained even once, not even if the whole world were offered her, it would be impossible for such a woman to be left to shame. If, however, in his secret justice, God permitted such a one to fall, it would rather lead to her reward than to sin, provided that she fell against her will. Know, then, that God is like an eagle that from on high views everything down below. If an eagle should see anything rising up from the ground, it immediately swoops down and snatches it. If it catches sight of something poisonous coming against it, it would pierce it like an arrow. If something unclean is dropped on it from above, it gets rid of it with a great shake just like a goose does. God acts like that as well. If he sees human hearts rising against him due to the weakness of the flesh or the devil's temptations against the will of the Spirit, he immediately swoops down through an inspiration of contrition and penance and brings it to naught, making the person return to God and come to himself again. If the poison of carnal desire or greed enters the heart, God quickly pierces the mind with the arrow of his love so that the person does not persevere in sin and gets separated from God. If some impurity of pride or the dirt of lust defile the spirit, he shakes it quickly off, just like a goose, through constant faith and hope, so that the spirit does not become hardened in vice or the soul that is joined to God becomes stained unto damnation. Therefore, my daughter, in all your feelings and actions, consider God's justice and mercy, and always keep the end in sight. Blessed are you, my God, 
who are three in one, three persons in one nature. You are goodness and wisdom itself. You are beauty and power itself. You are justice and truth itself. All things live and subsist through you. You are like a flower that grows alone in a field. All those who draw near to it receive sweetness for their palate, an uplift for their spirits, a delight for their eyes and strength in every other limb. Likewise, all who come near to you become more beautiful by leaving sin behind, more wise by following your will rather than the flesh, more righteous by seeking the advantage of the soul and the glory of God. Therefore, most kind God, grant me to love that which pleases you, to resist temptations bravely, to scorn all worldly things and to keep you constantly in my memory. The mother answers, This salutation came to you through the merits of good Jerome, who left false wisdom and found true wisdom, who scorned earthly honor and was rewarded with God himself. Happy is such a Jerome, happy those who imitate his life and doctrine. He was a lover of widows, a mirror for those advancing toward perfection, a teacher of all truth and purity. But tell me, my daughter, what is troubling you in your heart? She said, a thought occurred to me that said, If you are good, your goodness is enough for you. Why judge and admonish and teach your betters, something that belongs neither to your state nor position? This thought so hardens the spirit that it even neglects its own progress and grows completely cold to God's love. The mother answers, This thought has also held back many advanced souls from God. The devil hinders good people from speaking to the wicked so that they may not be brought to feel compunction. He also hinders them from speaking to the good so that they will not be raised to a higher rank, for, when good people hear good doctrine, they are raised to a greater reward and a higher rank. For example, the eunuch who was reading Isaiah would have received one of the lesser punishments in hell. But Philip met him and taught him a shortcut to heaven and so raised him up to a level of happiness. Likewise, Peter was sent to Cornelius. If Cornelius had died beforehand, he would indeed have come to a place of rest because of his faith. But then came Peter and led him to the gateway to life. Similarly, Paul came to Dennis and led him to the reward of blessedness. For this reason, the friends of God should not grow tired in God's service but should labor on in order that the wicked may be made better and the good may attain a greater perfection. Anyone with the will to whisper in the ears of every passerby that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God, and who struggles as far as he or she can for the conversion of others, even though no one or only a few convert, will still obtain the same reward as if all of them had converted. I will show you this by means of a comparison. If, on the order of their Lord, two mercenaries dig through the hard rock of a mountain, and one of them were to find choice gold there, but the other none, both of them would be deserving of the same wages because of their work and their intention. In the same way, Paul, who converted many people, and the other apostles, who converted fewer, were nevertheless all united in their intention. God's dispensation, however, remains hidden. One should therefore never give up, not even if only a few or none at all are open to God's words. As the thorn protects the rose and the donkey carries his master, so too the devil, like a thorn of sin, is as useful to the elect through the tribulations he causes as thorns are to roses. In this way, they are not stupidly overcome by the presumption of their hearts. Thus, just like a donkey, he conveys them to God's consolation and a greater reward. The son speaks, If I could get upset, I would rightly be able to say now, I regret having made humankind. They have become like animals that of their own free will run into the nets. However much you cry out to them, they still follow their own selfish appetites. And not all the blame can be put on the devil's violent attempts on humankind, no, rather, the people themselves outstrip his malice. Like hunting dogs that are first led on leashes, but then, once they are accustomed to catching and devouring animals, speedily reach the prey ahead of their leader, so also humankind, now accustomed to sinning and fascinated by it, is quicker to sin than the devil is to tempt. That is not strange. It has been a long time since the apostolic see, the head of the world, was pleasing to God by its sanctity of life and example, as it was in earlier times, and all the other members have therefore been made weak and listless. They do not consider the reason why God and his riches became poor and needy in order to teach us to scorn perishable things and to love heavenly ones. Man is poor by nature but has become rich by means of false riches. This is what everyone tries to imitate, 
and few are found who do not imitate it. Hence, the plowman shall come from the Almighty. Wedded by the wisest one, he does not seek property or beautiful bodies nor has any respect for the power of the mighty nor fears the threats of princes nor is swayed by human favor. He shall sow human flesh and raise to the ground the homes of spirits. He shall deliver bodies to maggots and souls to the ones whom they served. Therefore, may my friends, to whom I am sending you, labor with courage and with haste, for what I am telling you will not take place in the last days, as I said before, but in these very days. Many of those yet living will see with their own eyes the fulfillment of the scripture that says, May their wives be widows and their sons fatherless, and they shall lose all that they desire. However, I, merciful God, shall receive all those that come to me in humility. I shall give myself to those who fulfill the works of righteousness, for it is right to clean out the house in which the king shall enter, to wash the glass so that the drink may be clear, to thresh the grain briskly from its husks, and to press down hard on whatever is being molded into a form so that it attains the shape of the form. As summer comes after winter, so too I shall grant consolation after their hardships to those who long to be as little children, and who place more value on the things of heaven than on those of earth. However, just as a man is not born and dies at one and the same time, so all this will be fulfilled in its own time. Know that I intend to treat some people according to the common proverb. The whip will spur him on the pain will compel him to speed up. I will treat others as it is written, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. To a third set of people I shall speak soothingly and inspiringly, come, ignorant and simple persons, and I shall give you a mouth and a wisdom such as the tongue waggers will not be able to oppose. This is what I have already done in these days, I have filled the simple with my wisdom, and they are proof against the learned. I cast out the boastful and mighty, and they quickly subsided. That is no wonder, for I commanded the wise to cut off the serpent's tongues, as you heard, and they refused. Not even their mother, who was the scourge of the commons, was willing to quench their throats in order to quench the fire of desire kindled in her children's hearts, as I bade. This is why I have cut them down in their season of happiness, and have cut off their own tongues. John the Evangelist said to God's mother, Hear me, virgin and mother of one son, not several sons, mother of the only begotten Son of God, the fashioner and redeemer of all things. Listen, I say, as you surely do listen, to how this man has been deceived by the devil, how he is struggling to obtain something impossible, how and in what matters he has been instructed by the spirit of lies, how far he has removed himself from God in his sheep's clothing but with his lion's heart. I taught that there are three who bear witness in heaven and on earth, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The evil spirit, however, bears witness to this man that he has become completely holy. Yet the Father does not strengthen him with his power, nor does the Son visit him with his wisdom, nor does the Holy Spirit inflame him with his love. That is no wonder, for he aspires to power against the power of the Father. He wants to be wise against the wisdom of the Son. He is inflamed but not as the Holy Spirit sets aflame. So ask your Son either to take him away soon, so that no more souls may be lost, or to humble him quickly for his errors. The mother answered, Hear me, then, virgin, though you are a male and not a female person. You are the one whom it pleased God to call away from the world through the easiest of deaths after my own. Indeed, it was as though I had fallen asleep when my soul and body were separated, but then I awoke in everlasting joy. No wonder, indeed, for I had suffered more bitterly than all the others at my son's death, and it pleased God thus to separate me from the world through the easiest of deaths. But you were closest to me among the apostles, and the object of greater signs of affection than all the others, and my son's passion was bitterer for you than for the rest, because you beheld it at a closer distance than others, and you also lived longer than the others, as if you became a martyr through the deaths of them all. It therefore pleased God to call you from the world through the easiest of deaths after my own, for the virgin had been entrusted to a virgin. Therefore, what you asked for shall be done without delay." My daughter, let me show you what sort of person this man is of whom we are speaking. He is like a servant of that coin maker, the devil. The devil melts down, and then stamps his coin that is, his servant with his suggestions and temptations, until he has fashioned him after his liking. 
once he has corrupted and twisted a person's will toward the pleasures of the flesh and the love of the world, he then impresses his image and signature on the person, and it becomes apparent enough from external signs who it is whom that person wholeheartedly loves. When a man carries out an act the desire of his mind and wants to get more involved in worldly affairs than his state and life requires, and would do and desire even more things, if he were able, then he is shown to be the devil's perfect coin. You should realize, however, that God's coin differs from the devil's coin. God's coin is of gold, shining, pliable, and precious. Every soul with the stamp of God on it shines with divine love, is pliable in her patience, and precious in her continual good works. Accordingly, every good soul is melted down by God's power and tested with many temptations. Through them the soul, contemplating her defects and her origins as well as God's kindness and patience toward her, is rendered all the more precious to God, the more humble, patient, and conscientious she is found to be. The devil's coin, however, is of copper and lead. It is copper, because it bears a likeness to gold. It is hard and pliable, yet not the way gold is. Likewise, the unrighteous soul seems to herself to be righteous, judges everyone, is more interested in herself than in others, is unpliable with respect to humble actions, soft and acting in her own interest, intractable in her own plans, admirable to the world, despicable to God. The devil's coin is also let in in that it is ugly, soft, and pliable, and heavy. Likewise, the unrighteous soul is ugly in her lustful desires, burdensome in her longing for the world, as pliable as a reed that bends in the direction of whatever the devil inspires in her mind, sometimes, indeed, being even more ready to do it than the devil is to tempt her to it. This is the disposition of the coinmaker's servant. He gets bored in keeping the observances of his rule, as he vowed, and thinks up ways of gaining people's appreciation through a pretended holiness, all the while feeding his body sumptuously. The devil, then, soon filled his head with lies at night. They deluded him into believing impossible things that will not come to be. Instead, his life will be cut short, and he will not obtain the honor for which he so longs. Whenever one comes across an unknown coin, one sends it to a wise expert who has sufficient knowledge of its weight and shape. But where will we find such an expert? Even if we did find him, he may care little or nothing about whether the coin is counterfeit or genuine. There is only one solution in such a case, as I will explain by way of a comparison. If you handed a florin to a dog, it would not bother to take it. But if the florin were coated with fat, there is no doubt that the dog would take it then. The present case is like that. If you went to a theological expert and said that man is a heretic, he would not be bothered, for his love of God is altogether grown cold. However, if you said, he has plenty of florins, then everyone would rush to him. Therefore, it will soon be as Paul says, I will destroy and humble the wisdom of the wise, and I will exalt the humble. My daughter, you can recognize both the Holy Spirit and the unclean spirit through seven signs. First, the Spirit of God makes a man deem the world worthless and consider in his heart all worldly honor as mere air. Second, it endears God to the soul, and all delight in the flesh grows cold. Third, it inspires him to patience and to glorying only in God. Fourth, it stimulates the mind to be loving and compassionate with one's neighbor and even with one's enemies. Fifth, it inspires him to all kinds of abstinence, even from licit things. Sixth, it makes him trust in God in the midst of hardships, and even to glory in hardships. Seventh, it gives him the desire of wanting to depart and to be with Christ, rather than to prosper in the world and become soiled. The evil spirit has seven effects to the contrary. First, it makes the world seem sweet and heaven distasteful. Second, it makes a man seek honors and forget about the meaning of his life. Third, it arouses hatred and impatience in the heart. Fourth, it makes him bold toward God and obstinate in his own plans. Fifth, it leads him to make light of his sins and to make excuses for them. Sixth, it inspires in him frivolity of mind and every carnal impurity. Seventh, it inspires in him the hope of a long life and a feeling of shame about going to confession. Guard your thoughts carefully then, so that you do not get deceived by this spirit. Explanation This was a priest of the Cistercian order who, 
after 18 years of apostasy, repented and returned to the monastery. He said that it was impossible for anyone to be damned and denied that God spoke with anyone in this world or that anyone could see the face of God prior to God's judgment. When Lady Bridget heard this, the Holy Spirit said to her, Go and tell that brother this. Brother, you do not see as I do how the devil still keeps your mind and tongue tied even in your old age. God is eternal, and his reward is eternal. Therefore, return quickly and wholeheartedly to God and to the true faith, for you will assuredly not get up out of this bed but die. However, if you believe, you will be a vessel for God's honor. He was reduced to tears and thanked Lady Bridget, and he reformed his life so perfectly that, when his brothers were called together at the hour of his death, he told them, O oh my brothers, I am assured that God All-Merciful has accepted my contrition and will grant me pardon. Pray for me, because I believe everything that the Holy Church believes. Then, after having received God's sacraments, he passed away. The mother speaks, When a vat of beer is heated up and starts to swell and rise, it steams and foams up, sometimes more, sometimes less and then suddenly settles down again. People standing around the vat understand that these exhalations quickly sink down and that they arise due to the strength of the beer and are a way of releasing the heat. So they wait patiently for it to end and for the beer or the wine to be ready. Two things happen when people standing around the vat put their noses too close to the bubbles. They suffer either a violent sneezing or a bad headache. It is the same in the spiritual life. It sometimes happens that some people's hearts swell and rise due to the pride and impatience of their minds. When virtuous men see such a swelling up, they understand that it proceeds either from spiritual instability or carnal motives. Therefore, they put up patiently with that person's insulting words and look toward the end, knowing that the calm follows the storm, and that patience is stronger than a besieger of cities, since it conquers the man within, which is the most difficult thing to do. There are, however, those who are overly impatient, and they repay insult for insult. Paying no attention to the glorious reward of patience, nor to the contemptibility of worldly favor, these people incur an illness of mind due to their impatient temptations they bring their noses too close to the bubbling vat. That is, they take the insults, which are nothing but air, too much to heart. So, whenever any of you see people being impatient, guard your tongues with God's help and do not leave off doing the good work you have begun because of impatient words. Pretend instead, and as far as justice allows, that you have not heard what you have heard, until those people who are looking for an argument say explicitly what they mean in their hearts. The mother speaks, You should be like a bride standing before the bed curtain, ready to do as the bridegroom wishes as soon as he calls. This bed curtain is the body that veils the soul and has to be constantly washed, tried, and tested. The body is like a donkey that needs a diet moderate enough so as not to become gluttonous, sensible work so as not to become proud, and constant beating so as not to grow lazy. So stand by the bed curtain, that is, stand by the body but not in the body in the sense of attending to the desires of the flesh but nourishing the body on a moderate diet of necessities. That person stands by the body and not in the body who keeps his or her body from unnecessary desire for food. Stand also behind the bed curtain in the sense of scorning the lust of the flesh, doing honor to God, and spending your energies entirely for Him. In this way stood those who spread their bodies out like clothes for God, who were at all times ready to do as He wished, whenever it pleased Him to call them. They did not have a long way to go to Him whom they kept ever present. Heavy burdens did not weigh upon their necks, for they scorned every burden and were in the world in body alone. This is why they flew free and unimpeded to heaven. Nothing impeded them but a dry and well-disciplined garment, and when they had taken it off, they obtained their heart's desire. This man had a dangerous fall but wisely raised himself up. He defended himself like a man, fought steadfastly, and persevered with persistence. This is why he shall now receive an eternal crown and find himself already in the presence of God. A tree has many blossoms but not all of them come to fruition. Likewise there are many virtuous acts, yet they do not all merit a reward in heaven, if they are not done with wise discretion. For example, fasting, prayer, visits to shrines of the saints are virtuous acts, but if they are not done with the spirit of a person who hopes to enter heaven with humility, 
considering himself a useless servant in every way and showing wise discretion in everything, then they are of little value for eternity. Consider the case of two men, one of whom is under obedience, while the other is free and unbound. If the one who is free fasts, he will get an ordinary reward. However, if the one who is under obedience eats meat on a day of fasting in accordance with the ordinance of his rule and for the sake of obedience, though he would rather fast if it had not been against obedience, then he will get a double reward first, because of his obedience, second, because he put off his own desire and did not carry out his own wishes. You should therefore be like a bride who prepares the bridal chamber before the bridegroom comes. Be also like a mother who prepares the baby's clothes before it is born. Again, be like a tree that bears flowers before the coming of the fruits. Finally, be like a clean glass ready to receive the drink before it is poured. The mother speaks, That man there says he loves me, but he turns his back to me when he is serving me. When I speak to him, he says, What's that you say? And he averts his eyes from me and looks at other things more to his delight. He is strangely armed. He is like a soldier in a physical battle who has the visor of his helmet at the back of his head and carries his shield on his shoulders when he should have it on his arm. His scabbard is empty, for he had cast off his sword. His cloak, which should protect his chest and body, is lying under him on the saddle, and his saddle is not strapped to the horse. This is the way this man is armed spiritually in God's sight. Accordingly, he does not know how to distinguish between friend and foe nor how to inflict injury on the enemy. The spirit that fights in him is like one who reasons as follows. I want to be among the last line of soldiers in the fight, so that I can keep the thicket of the woods in sight, in case the first soldiers lose the battle. But if they win, I will run up front quickly so that I will be counted among the first soldiers. Thus, the man who gave up the fight acted according to the wisdom of the flesh and not for the love of God. The mother speaks, When you make dough, you have to knead and work it a lot. Fine wheaten bread is set before lords, but coarser bread is set before commoners, and an even worse kind of bread is given to dogs. The kneading stands for hardship. A spiritual person suffers great hardship when God does not receive honor from his creatures and when there is little charity in them. Those who suffer in this way are the kind of fine wheat in which God and all the heavenly host rejoice. All those troubled by worldly adversity are like the coarser kind of bread. For many people, however, this coarser kind is good enough for them to reach heaven. Those who suffer because they are not able to do all the evil they wish are like the bread of the dogs in hell. The mother speaks, All these beings that you see surrounding you are your spiritual enemies, that is, spirits of the devil. The ones who can be seen with poles that have nooses are the ones who want you all to fall into mortal sins. Those whom you see with grappling hooks in their hands are the ones who desire to slow you down in God's service and make you reluctant to do good. Those holding the instruments with spikes like pitchforks to get a hold of and stimulate human desire are the ones who tempt you to take on good deeds that exceed your capacity whether they are fasts, vigils, prayers, and toils or just spending your money in an unreasonable manner. Since these spirits are so eager to harm people, you must have the intention of not wanting to offend God. Furthermore, you must ask God to give you aid against their cruelty. In this way, then, their threats will not harm you. It is written that Paul, that good apostle, said that he was a wise man in the presence of the prince who had arrested Peter, and he called Peter a truly poor man. Paul did not sin in this, because his words were for the honor of God. This is also the case with those who desire and long to speak God's words. Unless they are dressed in suitable attire, they cannot come before the Lord's. Thus, they do not sin by dressing suitably, so long as they do not in their heart and mind regard the gold and clothes and precious gems as being more precious than their old accustomed clothing, since all the things that seem precious are but earth. God's mother speaks. Someone hires a worker for a job and tells him, Carry sand from the shore and examine each load to see if you can find a grain of gold there. His wages will not be less if he finds nothing than if he uncovers a great amount. This is also the case of a person who for the love of God labors in word and deed for the advancement of souls. His wages will not be less if he converts none of them than if he converts many. It is just as in the teacher's example. He said, A warrior who goes off to war on the orders of his lord, 
who is willing to struggle mightily but returns wounded and without having captured the enemy, will for the sake of his good intention receive no less a reward, though the battle was lost, than if he had obtained victory. It is the same with the friends of God. For each word and deed they do for God's sake and for the benefit of souls, and for each hour of hardship they suffer for God's sake, they will be rewarded, whether many convert or none at all. The mother speaks, You have an expression that says that sort of thing could make me leave my homeland. I tell you so now, nobody in the world is so great a sinner provided he says in his heart that my son is the creator and redeemer of the universe and dear to him in his inmost heart that I am not prepared to come to him immediately, like a loving mother to her son, and hug him and say, what would you like, my son? Even if he had deserved the lowest punishment in hell, nevertheless, if only he has the intention of not caring for worldly honors or greed or carnal lust, such as the church condemns, and desires nothing but his own sustenance, then he and I will right away get along quite well together. Tell the man who composes songs of praise for me not for the sake of his own praise or reward but in praise of him who is worthy of all praise because of all his works that just as worldly princes give a worldly reward to the people who praise them, so I will give him a spiritual remuneration. Just as there are many notes on a single syllable, so it pleases God to give him a crown in heaven for each syllable in his song. It will be said of him, Here comes the praiser who did not compose his song for any temporal good but for God's sake alone. Explanation This man had temptations concerning the Holy Trinity. In an ecstasy he saw what looked like the faces of three women. The first said, I have attended many weddings, but I have never seen one to be three. The second answered, If there are three in one, it is necessary that one of them must be prior and another posterior, or else two in one. And the third added, they cannot have created themselves, so who made them? Then the Holy Spirit said openly, We will come to him, and make our abode in him. And when he awoke, he was free of the temptation. After this, Christ said to Lady Bridget, I am one in three. I want to show you what the Father's power is, what the Son's wisdom is, what the Holy Spirit's might is, in order to make known that I, God, am three in one, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This revelation is complete once it is preached from the pulpit. Christ said again, Tell him that he gains greater merit in my sight through his illness than through his health. Lazarus grew brighter due to his pain, and Job more beloved due to his suffering. However, my chosen ones are not displeasing to me when they have good health, since their heart is always with me and their body remains in wise abstinence and pious works. Reverend Sir, in addition to the other points of discussion, the Pope should be told about the pitiable state of this city. Once it was a happy city, both materially and spiritually, but now it is unhappy, both materially and spiritually. It is materially unhappy, because its secular leaders, who should be its defenders, have turned into its cruelest plunderers. That is why its buildings lie in ruins. That is why many of its churches have been completely deserted in which are preserved the relics of the saints whose blessed bones shine with glorious miracles and whose souls have been crowned in God's kingdom on high. With their ceilings fallen in and their doors removed, the temples of these saints have been converted into latrines for men, dogs, and beasts. The city is spiritually unhappy, because many of the decrees issued in the church by holy popes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God and the salvation of souls have now been abolished. In their place, alas, many new abuses have been adopted under the inspiration of the evil spirit for the dishonor of God and the perdition of souls. The Holy Church had decreed that the clerics who were to go on to holy orders should follow a blessed way of life, serving God with solid devotion, and presenting to others a way of life worthy of the heavenly homeland through their good works. Ecclesial proceeds used to be given to such as these. Against this custom of the Church, however, a grave abuse has arisen. This is that the goods of the church are given to laymen who, because of their canonical title, do not get married but, instead, shamelessly keep concubines in their homes by day and in their beds at night, asserting boldly, we are not allowed to marry, because we are canons. Priests, deacons, and subdeacons, once upon a time, greatly abhorred the infamy of an impure life. Now, however, some of them are plainly delighted to see their whores walking about with swollen bellies in the midst of other women. 
They do not even blush when they are told by their friends, a daughter or son will soon be born for you, sir. Such men are more justly called the devil's pimps than ordained priests of the supreme God. The Holy Fathers such as Benedict and others established monastic rules with the permission of the supreme pontiff. They built monasteries where the abbots used to live together with the friars, devoutly celebrating the night hours and day hours of the office and carefully forming the monks in a life of virtue. It was a pleasure, indeed, to visit monasteries then, when the chant of the monks used to give honor and glory to God by day and night, when people of evil living were set right by the very beauty of the monks' lives, when good people were strengthened by the godly teaching of prelates, and when the souls in purgatory obtained a blessed rest through their devout prayers. That monk was then held in highest honor who observed the rule most carefully, and he had the respect of God and men. A monk, however, who did not bother to keep the rule knew without a doubt that he would incur scandal and damnation. Moreover, everyone used to be able to see and recognize a monk by his habit. However, contrary to that excellent arrangement, a detestable abuse has now sprung up in many places. Abbots dwell more frequently in their own castles or wherever they like, whether in the city or outside it. This is why it is now painful to visit monasteries. Very few monks show up in the choir at the time for the divine office, and sometimes none at all. There are few readings, and sometimes no chants, and many days masses are not even said. Good people are disturbed by the bad reputation of the monks, and bad people are made much worse by contact with them. Furthermore, it is to be feared that few souls receive any alleviation of their punishments from the prayers of such as these. Many monks live in town. Some of these have their own homes, and when their friends come to visit, they pick up their own children with a joyful hug, saying, Here's my son. A monk can scarcely be recognized nowadays in habit. The cloak that used to reach down to the feet now scarcely covers the knees. The long sleeves, which used to be decently wide, are now tight-fitting and crimped. A sword hangs at their side instead of a stylus and writing tablets. Hardly a single garment can be found on them to denote a monk, except for a scapular, which is often hidden from view as though it were some kind of scandal to be wearing a monkish garment. It does not even embarrass some of them to have a coat of mail and other weapons beneath their cloaks so that they can do what they like after their drinking bouts. There have been saints who gave up great wealth and started monastic orders based on poverty, who practiced contempt toward any kind of cupidity, and consequently, did not wish to have anything of their own. They abhorred all kinds of conceit and worldly pomp. They dressed in the purest of clothes, utterly detesting the concupiscence of the flesh, and thus maintaining their purity of life. They and their followers are called mendicant friars, and the Roman pontiffs confirmed their rules with joy seeing that they wanted to follow such a way of life for the glory of God and the benefit of souls. Yet it is a sorrow to behold even their rules now converted into detestable occasions of abuse and scarcely observed in the way that Augustine, Dominic, and Francis prescribed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, rules faithfully observed by many a wealthy nobleman for such a long time. To be sure, as rumor now has it, there are many men called wealthy who, as far as valuables and money are concerned, are poorer than those who have taken a vow of poverty. Thus, most of them have their own possessions, which their rule forbids, and find greater joy in their accursed property than in holy and glorious poverty. They pride themselves, moreover, on having as expensive and precious material in their habits as found in the vestments of wealthy bishops. Furthermore, Blessed Gregory and other saints had convents built in which women could live in such seclusion that they were hardly to be seen even in daytime. Now, however, there is so much abuse in the convents that their doors are kept open for clerics and laymen alike, whomever it pleases the sisters to let in, even at night. Accordingly, such places are more like brothels than holy cloisters. It also used to be the church's rule that no one was to receive money for hearing confessions, although, as was only just, penitentiaries were allowed to accept money from persons in need of testimonial letters. A contrary abuse has now arisen according to which rich persons offer however much they like, once they have made their confession, while poor people, before their confession is heard, are forced by the penitentiary to come to an agreement. Indeed, when penitentiaries give oral absolution, they are not ashamed to take money in their hands and put it in their pockets. 
it was likewise established in the church that at least once a year every person should confess his or her sins and receive the body of Christ. This applied to lay people, because clerics and religious did this more often during the year. Second, it was established that people unable to practice continence should live in matrimony. A third rule was that, with the exception of those who were seriously ill or in great difficulties, all Christians were to fast during Lent and on Ember Days and the vigils of other feast days, which are still well enough known to almost everybody. The fourth rule was that everyone was to abstain from any kind of worldly labor on feast days. The fifth was that no Christian should make financial or any other kind of profit through usury. Contrary to these five excellent statutes, there have arisen five immoral and seriously harmful abuses. The first is that for every one person who goes to confession and receives the body of Christ, not counting priests, religious, and certain women, there are one hundred who come of age and die here in Rome without ever having gone to confession or received the body of Christ any more often than genuine idolaters. The second abuse is that many men take legally wedded wives, but if they have a disagreement with them, they abandon them for as long as they like, without the requisite authorization from the church, and take mistresses in their wives' place, loving them and holding them in honor. Some of them do not even shrink from keeping a mistress in the same house as their wife, but rather rejoice to hear them both giving birth at the same time. The third abuse is that many people in good health eat meat during Lent and very few are content with one meal a day. Some are found who do abstain from meat and eat Lenten fare during the day but indulge themselves with meat at night in secret taverns. Indeed, sometimes clerics do this together with laymen. They are just like the Saracens who fast by day and indulge themselves with meat at night. The fourth abuse is that, while some laborers do abstain from work on feast days, there are wealthy men who do not leave off sending their hired hands to work in the vineyards, plow the fields, cut down trees in the woods, and carry the wood home on feast days. In this way, poor people enjoy no more quiet rest on feast days than on work days. The fifth abuse is that Christians practice usury just like the Jews, and in fact, Christian usurers are greedier than Jewish ones. Further, it was the custom of the church to bring such people as described above into line by means of anathema. But contrary to this, the following abuse has now arisen. There are, namely, a great number of people who are no more afraid of being condemned than they are of being commended. Even if they know that they have been publicly excommunicated, they do not even bother to avoid entering the church or other dealings and conversations with people. In fact, few priests forbid excommunicates from going into a church. Few as well shun dealings and conversations with excommunicates, if they are bound to them by any kind of friendship. Nor is sacred burial denied to excommunicated people, if they are rich. Accordingly, Reverend Sir, do not be surprised if I have described the city of Rome as unhappy due to such abuses and many others opposed to ecclesiastical statutes. Hence, it is to be feared that the Catholic faith will soon perish, unless some such man arrives who, with a real and not a counterfeit faith, loves God above all things and his neighbor as himself and abolishes all these abuses. Have compassion, then, on the church and on those of her clergy who love God wholeheartedly and abhor all these wicked customs. They have been like orphans due to the Pope's absence, but they have defended the see of their father like sons and have wisely opposed the traitors, persevering in the midst of much hardship. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death, Amen.